Okay, so I will start. So we had started to talk about products. Um, so I had uh, I told you that. Uh, oh. So if we have. Um, was about products. So I first was talking about products of uh, fine varieties, of closed varieties of uh, An. So if x in An and y in Am are closed subvarieties. Um, then we have that their product x times y lies in An plus m and is a closed subvariety too. So it's easy to talk about products of um, uh, both subvarieties of An. And in fact, uh, I'm going to need this later, is that this also works if they are locally closed. So this is an easy exercise. If uh, x in An and y in Am are locally closed subvarieties, Uh, then it follows that x times y is locally closed. Subvariety. Okay, I didn't prove it, but it's easy how to see how you would modify the proof. And um, then one thing that we had was the universal property. And that uh, said, basically, that um, if I have such a product, uh, P1 from x times y to x and P2 from x times y to y are morphisms. So, so x subset An and y subset Am uh, closed subvarieties, but one can again see that one can easily generalize uh, the same proof would prove it for locally closed subvarieties. Um, then these are morphisms. And uh, secondly, um, we have that uh, a map phi from any, so if uh, z. Z is any variety, then a map phi from Z to X times Y is a morphism if and only if uh, the compositions with the two projections are morphisms. So Okay, this is one reformulation of what we stated the other, what we proved the other time. So that's um, as much as we had done for uh, closed or locally closed subvarieties of a fine space to do the, to study the products. And now we want to look at the case of quasi-projective varieties. And uh, <clears throat> the problem, as I had said, is that if x is in Pn and y in Pm are subvarieties, it is not by itself true that x times y will lie in some projective space.
So as uh, quasi, you know, as the most general things we are studying are quasi-projective varieties, we want the things actually to lie in some projective space and not in the product of projective spaces, although we could also do that. But anyway, that's not how we do things. <coughs> we somehow have to make this thing lie in some projective space. And we do this, so, <coughs> so, so thus we uh, find an embedding. So this in the moment just means an injective map from Pn times Pm to some larger projective space. And uh, we will uh, identify x times y with the sigma of x times y. So we, um, we study, um, so in, instead of actually taking the product, we take, we look at the image here. It's the image under an injective map. Um, and uh, so then this thing has a structure of a quasi-projective variety when X and Y are quasi-projective varieties. We will see that. Okay, so first I want to define this embedding, which is called the, or this, this map here, which is called the Sega embedding. Yes? What? Why no is projective space the product? I mean, so. Is project is projective space why? So I mean, uh, so I don't precisely understand the question, but I think you are asking whether why it is not true that the product of projective space is the projective space. Yeah. Well, it just isn't. If you look at the definition, you know, it's a different thing. You know, the, you know, the, it's not the no, it's not the same, no. The product of two projective spaces is not a projective space, no. If you look at the definition, it's really different. You have pairs of n two, of n, an n plus one tuple and an n plus one tuple, where on each of them, it's up to multiplying by a constant. And that's really a different thing than taking some other tuple up to multiplying by one constant. It's really a different space. And if you, for instance, if one does algebraic topology, so if you do it over the complex numbers, you can look at the, the homology of, <laughs> of, of a projective space, and you will find that, uh, you know, this has a z in all even degrees until dimension n for pn, and for pn times pm, it looks quite different. So it has, a, it has also some some high, some cohomology groups which are larger than that. So it's really not the same, okay? So it's, um, <clears throat> anyway. So, I mean, just to connect uh, with that. So, you know, you can even see, well, whatever. Well, I will tell you what N is. Now, for some n, which I will now specify, in fact, I think it's the first thing I write down. Um, so, so now we come to the definition. And as a first statement, I will answer your question. So we put n to be uh, n plus 1 times n plus 1 minus 1. Okay, so it's a <laughs> very precise n. And... Um, <coughs> So, so we want to take Pn like this when we start with these. So we let, so I want to define this Sager embedding. So definition Sager embedding. After some Italian mathematician, Benjamino Segre, who defined this. <coughs> So we take x0 to xn, the uh, homogeneous coordinates on Pn. We take uh, y0 to ym, the coordinates on Pm. And we also want to somehow take the coordinates on this large Pn. So these I call z 
i j, so it depends on two indices, um, where i goes from zero to n, and j goes from zero to m, are the coordinates on Pn. You can see that the dimensions match. Here we have n plus one times m plus one, and then the projective space has dimension one less. No? So you have uh, homogeneous coordinates. And so, uh, but somehow I want to not enumerate them from you know, zero to n, but I want to enumerate them by pairs of, of such numbers, which somehow correspond to the coordinates of Pn on Pn. Okay, now we define our map. So we define a map, sigma, or if you want also sigma nm, but I will usually forget the nm, from pn times pm to pn. So this is just a set theoretic map that I'm defining. I'm not defining a morphism, no, because we don't know this is from our point of view, not a quasi projective variety, so we don't know what a morphism is supposed to be. So we just define a map. Um, and how we do it? So if we have two points, A0 to AN, a point in PN, and B0 to BM, a point in PM, we send this to all the products. So the IJth coordinate here will be the product of AI times BJ. Okay. So this is a point here. Okay. And sigma is called the Sager embedding. So first, we want to see, see that sigma is well defined. I mean, that's kind of trivial. So if you, I maybe just say it, if you multiply all the coordinates here by lambda, you get an equivalent point here. If you multiply all the coordinates here by mu, you get an equivalent thing. And if you do this, for both of them, you multiply all the coordinates by lambda times mu. And so you see that the class uh, depends only on the class. So this is well defined. Okay. And I, I write sigma and m, or sometimes just sigma, if I remember who n and m is, um, the image. Okay, so this would be some subset in Pn. So now we want to somehow, so on, you know, on Pn, we have these charts Ui, so these open subsets Ui, which cover it, where one of the coordinates is non-zero. We have them also here, and we have them also here, and we want to somehow say something about how they are connected, so, and introduce notation, so for i equals one, zero to n, um, we put ui equal to, uh, I mean, the corresponding ui on pn, so the set of all a zero to a n and p n such that a i is different from zero. And for j from zero to m, we put u j, the corresponding thing on p m. So this is an n, no? p zero to p m in p m such that bj is non-zero. And you see that obviously this is a certain abuse of notation because sometimes 
i is both lower than n and m, and it defines two different uh, things. But the idea is just that, you know, for, to make life easier for me, whenever I have an i, it means I'm in Pn, and whenever I have a j, I'm in Pm. So you just, uh, uh, so that one doesn't have to write so much. And uh, obviously, we also have, for the same uh, i and j's, we have uh, uij, which is um, the set of all points in Pn, P large n, whatever a i j in uh, P large n. I know I cannot have the same index. Uh, such that aij is not zero. Okay, these are the, the corresponding charts on the p large n, the p corresponding open sets, subsets. And we know that each of, that these open sets are isomorphic to the corresponding affine spaces. So we have a, um, we have a ui from, which way does it go around? Yeah, an to, or maybe I write it like this, we have isomorphisms. So we have An is isomorphic via Ui to Ui, and the inverse map is Phi I. In the same way, we have Am is uh, isomorphic via Uj to large Uj, and the inverse map is Phi J. And uh, finally, a large n is isomorphic via uij to uij, and the inverse map is phi ij. So this just is to introduce the notation. So what else do I need in order to you see whether I, and so, so we see that, for instance, Pn obviously is just the union over the Ij of the Uij's in the same way as before. These are these open subsets where one coordinate is non-zero. This is an open cover. And so sigma, which is, uh, the image of this map in Pn is uh, equal to the union over all Ij, um, sigma intersected Uij. And these things, these, uh, this is also an open cover of sigma. So it's a cover, I mean, it's a cover of sigma by intersections with sigma to open sets, <coughs> um, uh, such that, um, so I, I will also write this one as sigma ij. So we have a lot of notation. And finally, we have one more piece of notation, then we can actually start. So, um, so I write sigma ij like this to be the map from a n plus m to uij. So how does it go? Um, if we have a, so I can take a point of An plus M is a point of An, so a pair of points P in An, Q in Am. So we take a pair PQ and we send it. So first we go to the corresponding open subset in the projective space. So this is uh, Ui of P. and uj of q. And then we apply the map sigma. So here we are in, these are some points in Pn times Pn. This is a point in Pn times Pm. We can apply sigma. Okay, and this will be a point in uij. In fact, it will be a point in uij intersected sigma. 
And so in fact, by definition, we have that um, the image of this map is precisely sigma ij. No? We see that um, you know, if you, so one direction is clear, we, we know that uh, this maps it into this, but um, it's clear that <coughs> you know, for the ijth coordinate here to be non-zero, we need that the ith coordinate here and the jth coordinate here is non-zero, which means precisely that it comes from here. Okay, and now we are in a position to state the result about this. So now I have to wipe it out, but you have to you know all you have all the notations in your mind. <laughs> So theorem So first sigma is injective and the image is a closed subset a closed subset yeah and sigma is closed in PN. Okay, later see it's also closed sub variety, but that's not immediate. Um, and in fact, we can see how it's given. So sigma can be written as a zero set of the following uh, set of equations of degree of uh, polynomials of degree two. So I take Z i j times Z KL minus Z I L Z K J. And this is for all possible I J's and so on. So I comma K run from zero to N and uh, J and L run from zero to M. No, because the first is always the coordinate which, uh, okay. So we have a certain, so by itself this is n plus one times n plus one equations, but some of them are maybe trivial, but anyway, so this is what we have. <coughs> so I claim that this set, the image, is the, zeros, the common zero set of these equations, of these polynomials. Um, well, yeah, it would, uh, let me see. I expect it's, in a, a, you can, you can write a matrix of which it is a determinant, yeah, but it's, you know, this is just, these are just four terms, no? So it's not by itself the determinant, you, you can, you would have, so, I expect you can write down some matrix so that it is all the two by two minus, but somehow that's not particularly useful, I think. So, I mean, by itself, you just have this, this equation. You, the, the point is here is that you, you see here, you have here i, j, k, l, and then you exchange. Uh, so, here i goes with j, that goes with l. So, you, you exchange the, how they are matched. But I expect uh, you can somehow most likely can find some matrix so that this will be the determinant of some minus. But, uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> okay. So, I think I will, you know, if I now state the whole theorem and then prove it, the obvious disadvantage is that, you know, I state the theorem, then I have to wipe it out and prove it. So maybe I will now prove the first part, then I state the second part and prove it and so on. I think that's easier to follow, no? Okay, so let me do that. So we start with the proof. So... So first, the injectivity is kind of trivial. Let's just, uh, in order to get started slowly, we can still do it. So if sigma from A0 to An, B0 to Bm, if that is equal to the corresponding thing for some other tuple, C0 
say E0 prime to A n prime E0 prime to E m prime. Well, then what? What does it mean? It means there exists some lambda in K, which is not zero, such that I can, you know, get the corresponding point he here, I mean the sigma of it, which we know what it is, by multiplying by lambda. So such that lambda times AI BJ, maybe with a prime, I do it like this, is equal to AI BJ for all I and J. So there's one lambda which does it for all of them. After all, this is the, or the this here is the, the vector which has these products as entries, and this is the vector which has those as entries. Okay, so exists one such. Now, these are non-zero vectors, so we certainly find um, that one coordinate, uh, <coughs> there certainly is one coordinate which is not zero. So, so choose, say, I0 and J0 such that A I0 times B J0 is non-zero. Okay. So then we can just, uh, you know, this holds for all I and J. So then we can do the following. So we have So then we have for all i, we have that if we put, I mean, you can write out a i times b j zero is equal to uh, which we do lambda times a i prime b j zero prime. And so we can divide here AI is equal to, um, what is it? Lambda BJ0 prime divided by BG0 times AI prime, times AI prime, yes. So, what this say, and this holds for all i. So that means, so this is some non-zero constant. Okay. So we have some non-zero constant so that if I multiply the vectors of the i primes with this non-zero constant, I get the other vector. So that means that a0 to a n is equal to a0 prime a n prime. Okay. And obviously the same proof with the role of i and j exchanged will show in the same way. We have that B0 to Bm is equal to B0 prime until Bm prime. Okay, so this shows the injectivity. Now we have uh, this more interesting fact that uh, the <coughs> that the image is closed. It's actually given by some explicit polynomials. So if I so let W be uh, the zero set on the, you know, here on the right hand side. So, on the right hand side of the equation, you know, on the left hand side of the blackboard. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so,
So, so clearly, we have that sigma is contained in W. Why is that clearly? So if we are in the image of sigma, then the ijth coordinate is ai times bj, where ai is a vector, where, where the a is a vector in, 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 in pn and b is a vector in pm. So if I have here ai times bj times ak times bl, obviously is equal to ai times bl times ak times bj. You know, multiplication happens to be commutative. So that is um, clear. But so now we have to see the other direction. So now let a uh, ij, again, the index indices go from 0 to n and 0 to m, or nj, uh, be an L a point in w. We have to show it's in, in sigma. So we choose uh, a, a coordinate where this thing is not zero. It shows k and l such that a k l is non-zero. You know, obviously this is a, a point in projective space, so it certainly has a non-zero coordinate. And then we just write it down. So we have our vector. This is a reasonable vector. We can certainly multiply it by a number, by a non-zero number, we take this one. No, this is the same vector. No, we just have multiplied by. But now we can use this equation. So we can move uh, the indices from one side to the other. So this is, so I can take akj, but using this equation, no? uh, times a, what is it, i, l. Was this an l? It's still i and j are running. No? So here something has really changed, but uh, you know this is okay by the equation. But what is that? I'm saying, you know, here we just have the ijth coordinate of this thing is a product something where we have a j here, and the product of something where we have a, have an i here. So. That means that this is actually equal to sigma of um, um, the vector. So here we have the one that runs here, the i. So a 0 l until a n l a k 0 until a. Okay. Yeah. This is how the map sigma was defined. No? And so we see it's in the image of sigma. Okay, so this proves the first part. Now I should state the second. So I had this map sigma ij, which I'm sure you will remember. So sigma ij from a n plus m. So this is now the second statement of the theorem. No? From a n plus m to uh, this. Ij. I am. I say is an isomorphism. Okay. 
Okay, so I find that um, this map sigma j. So that this this sigma j. After all, remember this was sigma intersected u i j. We find that this is actually isomorphic to a n plus n. You know, as it should maybe be if uh, you know this somehow is supposed to be you know what we get for p n times p m. And so locally, p n is equal to the open subset u i of a n is isomorphic to a n. The open subset u j of p m is isomorphic to a m. So we might hope that. Uh, and remember that the map was we take a map p q and it's mapped to sigma of um, u i of p u j of q. Okay. So let's see. Ah, uh -uh. so it is correct here. I only cancelled it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so obviously we can assume. So we do the proof. So we can assume that i is equal to j is equal to zero. No, I mean obviously this makes no difference. Um, <clears throat> so I can now look. If I look at the map phi zero zero composed with sigma zero zero. Um, so what does it do? Um, this will do what? It, it takes, uh, uh, an n tuple a one to a n and another one b1 to bm, and sends it to what? So maybe I can first, well, maybe I can do it slowly. So so if I apply this to this, what will we get? <coughs> So first we apply to sigma zero zeros, we map this into projective space. So this is uh, phi zero zero of uh, uh, <coughs> sigma of the thing starting with one, a one to n, one, b one to b m. And then the, uh, the sigma will consist in taking all possible products of these elements. So p, uh, so this is equal to the vector c i j. So i j goes from i from zero to one, j from zero to m, such that uh, c zero zero is equal to one, c um, i zero is equal. So a i c zero j is equal to b j. No, this is for i bigger equal to one j equal to one and uh, c i j is equal to a i b j for i and j bigger equal to one. No, that's uh, just the definition. And then we apply phi zero zero to it. 
So this is the same thing. So this will be C i j, i j, where i comma j is different from zero zero. So we just leave out this one. So maybe I write it like this. So, so in other, if you write it in coordinates, it means, um, you know, so I have here just the coordinates are just either a i or b j or a i times b j. So it's always a polynomial in the in the coordinates on uh, p n and <coughs> on on a n. So it follows that this is a morphism because it's given by regular functions on a n times a n. So phi zero zero composed with sigma zero zero is a morphism, and thus. Sigma zero zero is a morphism because uh, you know we just composed the inverse of an isomorphism. Okay, and we know now that by definition this map sigma zero zero is surjective onto uh, sigma zero zero, large sigma zero zero because that's the large sigma zero zero was defined as the image. So sigma zero zero and a n plus m is irreducible. So we know that if we have a subjective morphism uh, from something irreducible, I mean a subjective uh, map. So this is by itself is a morphism, yeah. If you have a trajective morphism, uh, then um, the image is irreducible because this is a continuous map. And if this was a union of two uh, closed subsets, then we, the inverse image would be the union of two closed subsets and so on. So it follows that sigma zero zero is irreducible. So uh, thus it is a quasi-projective variety. So, and we can define the inverse map. So, it's an, so sigma zero zero is an isomorphism because the inverse map, for instance, if I just uh, define it in coordinates, I claim is just um, um, Z n zero divided by Z zero zero until C, what? No, I'm bit C one zero until Z n zero divided by Z zero zero, and then Z zero one. Now, if you start with a zero to a n, a one to a n, and b one to b m, and we we do this, so the first co coordinate will then become one, and we see that if we apply this to it, we get back precisely what we had here, and also the other way around. So this is the inverse, and this is a morphism, no, because it's given by regular functions on on the open subset u zero zero, because. Uh, Okay, so this was the second part. Now we come to the third part of the theorem, which I I should find a way to oh, let's do here. So the third one is something very simple, but anyway. So for if I take a point, if Q is a point in PM, 
uh, than the map um, IQ. I actually shouldn't call it, maybe I call it IQ bar from um, Pn to P large n, which sends P to sigma of Pq is a uh, morphism. In fact, we'll see it's, uh, it's given by polynomials of degree one, and the image will be a projective subspace of Pn, so just a linear subspace. Anyway, so this is quite simple. And you just write down the definitions. So, so this is kind of obvious. So let um, Q be given in so as equal as B0 to M. And then what is IQ? Well, it's just you know, a point is just mapped to all the to the point in P large n, which is given by all the products of its coordinates with these coordinates. So in other words, IQ as a map is just uh, I take Bj Xi Ij. So the Ij's coordinate is Bj times Xi. And so you see this is you know, a, a map which is uh, given by polynomials of, t of degree one, so it certainly is a morphism. And we can see that the image is just a, you know, in some sense also projective space. So the image is the set of all Bj Ai, where A zero Ij, such that A zero so An is in An. This is, you know, it's actually the, pro the projectivization of some linear subspace of uh, a n plus one, of p a n plus one with a large n. So it's a projective linear subspace. Okay, so this was the third one. Now we proved this just to because we want to use it. I mean, this is not really a big deal, uh, but uh, we want to use it to prove that the product is irreducible. Because, you know, if you remember, we had this, this lemma for what we used for a fine uh, varieties, that if you have uh, the topology on the product uh, such that maps like this uh, are continuous, then, uh, and both factors are irreducible, then the product is irreducible. And so therefore, this will follow. <coughs> so let's see what the statement is. For, for x in Pn and y in Pm, uh, quasi-projective varieties, We have that uh, sigma of x times y is a quasi projective variety. And um, if x and y are both projective, then sigma of x times y is projective. I think that is all. OK. So this is a statement. So um, I maybe will, for simplicity, only prove the 
statement with a projective. So we assume x and y are projective, and then we prove that sigma of x times of sigma of x times y is a projective variety. It's easy, you know, you can easily uh, adapt the proof for the quasi projective case. If it's quasi projective, it is something closed minus something other closed, and then you have to you know, write a little bit more, but it's the same thing. So first, I want to show let x and y be projective algebraic sets. So So we first want to show that sigma of x times y is a projective algebraic set. And it's similar in the quasi-projective case. So sigma of x times y, I can write, if I want, this union over all i j of, uh, you know, sigma of x times y intersected u i j. That's not very exciting. But um, I know that this thing lands in u i j if and only if we are in the image of uh, the map phi ij. So I can also write it like this. Maybe you can see whether you believe me. Um, I take sigma ij of phi i of x, phi j of y, times phi j of y. So this would mean I take x intersected ui, then I map it to an, and then I apply sigma ij. No? And the same like this. So this is the same thing. So now, in order to show that something is closed subset, it's enough to prove that the intersection with any open subset of an open cover is closed in that open subset. So let's see. So phi i of x times phi j of y is a closed subset of um, an times an plus m. No, because uh, X is closed in, uh, say, in an. Um, then, if I in X is closed in in pn, if I intersect it with the, with ui, it's closed in in ui, and then phi is an isomorphism, and so this would be, so this thing would be closed in phi of X is closed in an, phi j of y is closed in am, and the product of two closed subsets like this is closed in an plus m. And uh, <coughs> sigma ij is an isomorphism. Oh. So sigma ij uh, from pn times pm to pn uh, to uh, Yeah, to sigma ij subset pn is um, is an isomorphism. Thus, it follows that uh, sigma ij of phi i of x times phi j of y is closed in sigma ij. Okay. And so 
we have an open cover of sigma by these open subsets sigma ij. And the intersection of the image is uh, closed in the open subset uh, for, um, for each open subset in the cover. So it follows that um, sigma of x times y is closed in um, sigma. And sigma is closed in sigma is closed in Pn such thus sigma of x times y is closed in Pn. No, it's closed and closed. Okay, so this proves that. So it is a closed, if we have a pro two projective algebraic sets, then the image of the product under the SIG embedding is also a projective algebraic set in P large N. And now we have to show it's irreducible. And we want to use the lemma that we had the other that we had last time. This said that if we have a topology on the product x times y, such that uh, so if x and y are both irreducible, and we have have a topology on the product such that this uh, map I Q P is sent to the pair P Q, and the uh, map uh, uh, J. Uh, P, Q is sent to PQ, is uh, continuous for all PQ, uh, then uh, the product will be irreducible. So we apply this here. So, so we have sigma from x times y to sigma of x times y is a bijection. So we could just say that we so thus we only need that um, so IQ which is the same as sigma composed with IQ no? IQ is a map P <coughs> maps to PQ that this map is continuous and also uh, JP. Continuous for all PQ. So we only need that. Then it will follow that, uh, you know, as X and Y are reduced, but it will follow that this is irreducible. Well, but we know that it's continuous because we have seen it's a morphism. So therefore, I mean, if we, you know, if we wanted to directly apply the previous lemma, we would have to argue on x times y. So then we would have to say we take this bijection and we use it to put the topology here that comes you know, to make this a homeomorphism. And then it would follow directly here. But you know, then it's the same statement here if we do it composed with sigma. Okay, so this proves the, uh, so this was the last part of the theorem. So, um, so we have, <clears throat> what have we managed to do? So we have this, uh, uh, this map, sigma, the Sagan embedding from Pn times Pm to Pn, P large N. And we see that it's injective. Um, the image is a closed subvariety. And in fact, if we apply it to a product of two 
subvarieties of Pn and Pm, the image will be a subvariety of P large n. And uh, <coughs> so, therefore, we we have somehow, you know, if instead of looking at x times y, we look at the image, which is you know bijective to the thing uh, we had before, then we get a, a, a variety, a projective variety in the sense that we had before. And so we just want to do that. We want to identify, uh, you know, the product x times y with its image in p large n under this map. So the al alternative, <coughs> you know, you could, um, so that, um, Otherwise, you would say this is not really an identification, but we define as what we call the product of x and y, the image of the product, so that it's a variety. So that our, and then by abuse of notation, this image we just call x times y, okay? Okay, so let me write this down or something. Knows where I am. So, um, okay, so we have again. So if um, X and Y, so X subset PN, Y subset PM are quasi projective varieties. You identify x times y with the image Pn, and in particular, you write, uh, you identify. Sigma of uh, Pn times Pm with the image Sigma. And so these are then, this uh, is a quasi projective variety. This would be a projective variety. So if we do it like this, we find that the product of varieties is again a variety. And um, let's see. So now we want to see that we can work with, the, with this in a nice way. So first, um, so in principle, obviously one could always, uh, I could do without this identification, it's just, but if we always have to remember the sigma and so on, it makes it a little bit more complicated. So it's easier to think that we're actually working on Pn times Pm. It's just that the, the, what are the closed subsets are just the inverse images of the closed subsets in Pn under, in P large n under this map and so on. And a, a function on this thing would be regular if and only if it's, uh, you know, the pullback of a regular function on, <coughs> on, PN, on, on the corresponding set in the image. So, a remark, um, if you still remember part two of the theorem, we said that um, um, what was it? said that in this map uh, sigma ij from an plus m to um, <coughs> sigma ij is an isomorphism. So if we now, you know, do this, uh, uh, translate this in the, uh, you know, you know, with this identification that we, instead of saying we are in sigma ij, we are in the corresponding 
open set subset ui times uj of uh, pn times pm, then this just says, so this part just says that if I take ui times uj in pn times pm is open, namely this is the, this would be the intersection of sigma with uij. Um, and if I take uh, the map phi i times phi j from uh, and now do uh, take the inverse of this map anyway it doesn't matter u i times u j to a n plus m is also an isomorphism. Because the, you know, the, this is just the sigma ij is just uh, the image of ui times uj, and this map, I mean, the inverse of this map is just phi i times phi j, if you look at how it is defined. So, I mean, phi i times phi j is just the map which sends map pq to phi i of p, phi i pj of q. And this is, with this identification, the inverse map of sigma ij. Okay. <clears throat> so we also have our charts, which are the obvious charts, you know, so the things that we have proven in this theorem translate into some very simple statements. I mean, if we do it in these coordinates, so that it somehow just tells us that we can work with the products, uh, you know, in the kind of obvious way. You know, everybody would think that the product of two open sets is a product, and if you take the product of two such charts, then this will again be a chart on the product. And this is true if we make this identification. This is what we have proven. Okay, we can maybe look at the simplest example, which is P1 times P1, because, uh, you know, the, in particular, we... <coughs> So if I take, now I take sigma of P1 times P1, which I kind of also, if I want, just call P1 times P1. This lies in P large N, where N is 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 minus 1. So this is 3. So, okay. <coughs> and this can be written... I claim this can be written as the zero set of just one equation, say z0, 0, 0, z11 minus z01, z10. Okay, so a priori, if you look at it, there, there will be more equations. I mean, the equations that I wrote down, it's for all, you know, there should be, what is it? four equations or something, but if you uh, write them down, most of them are just zero is equal to zero, and this is the only one that remains. There's one equation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you see that this thing is really the zero set of polynomial of degree two in P3 gives us P1 times P1. Um, and as I told you, um, for instance, if I, you know, we have here kind of some P1s in here. We have the point P times P1, and for a point P here, and the points Q times P1, the point Q here. And uh, so, so P1, so, so sigma of P1 times P1 contains two families of lines. Um, namely, uh, so sigma of P times P1. This will actually be a line in P3. And for all P in P1 and sigma of P1 times Q for all 
Q and P1. So through every point in P1, there will be two lines of this kind, you know, which, and you know, there is some, I have some kind of picture in the notes. I mean, it's difficult to imagine how this should go, but anyway, there is a, this thing is covered by these two families of lines. <laughs> Okay, so finally, I mean, it's not, I mean, for the moment, finally, I want to come to the universal property. So, um, so we had in the case of a fine variety, of products of a fine varieties, we had the product, we had the uh, universal property of the product. We want to show that the same universal property also holds here, is as if as our definition of the product, we take sigma of the product. And as I kind of tried to mention the other time, the thing which makes something into the product and behave like the product is the universal property. So therefore, if sigma of x times y fulfills the universal property of the product, it is for all means and purposes the product. Okay, so we have the universal property. It's the same as before. And it's also not much more difficult. We will reduce it to the um, fine case. So let X and Y be quasi-projective varieties. We can assume that X is in Pn, Y is in Pm. So then first, the two projections, P1, from x times, yeah. So I now write it in this uh, kind of abuse of notation. So I write p1 from x times y to x and p2 from x times y to y are morphisms. Okay, so this rather means you you know, you take, uh, what you really to take, you take sigma to the minus one composed with P1. You know? Anyway, these are morphisms. And the second statement is, um, if Z is any variety, the morphisms from, from uh, z to x times y, by which I really mean sigma of x times y, are precisely uh, given by pairs of morphisms, one to x and one to y. Uh, the, um, f g from z to x times y given by sending a point P to the pair F of P, G of P. And if one wants to not use the abuse of notation that the morphisms would be Z goes to sigma of X times Y and this would be FG composed with sigma or you know you just take sigma of this. You know? So it's the same thing. Okay. You know, to, to be a morphism, it's enough that its restriction to any open subset on a chart, uh, on an open cover is a morphism. So it's enough to see that P1 restricted to X times Y intersected ui times uj um, okay from so that this is a morphism but um, 
we could use what I just said. We have, um, you know, we have this map phi i times phi j from u i times u j to a n plus m, and then we have here the map p one to a n. And this certainly is a morphism. No, phi i times phi j was a morphism, so is a morphism. And uh, the p1 given here is just a restriction of this map. So this is not here, so this is Vi times Vj. Okay, and the same obviously for P2. So this, will, this shows that P1 and P2 are morphisms because in the charts they are morphisms. And now for the second part. So we have two uh, statements. So, you know, the morphisms are precisely those. So either, so if we are given a morphism, we have to show it's of this form. And if we have uh, given something of this form, we have to show it's a morphism. So first let H from Z to x times y, your morphism. Now we know that p1 and p2, the two projections are morphisms, so then f, which is uh, p1 composed with h, and g, which is equal to p2 composed with h, are morphisms. And by definition, H is, you know, FG, you know, is the map which sends the first, uh, sends uh, as a first uh, component, we have F of this and the second of this. So uh, we have and H is equal to FG. Okay, so this is the trivial direction. So now we want to go the other route. So let f from z to x and uh, g from z to y be morphisms. I have to show that this uh, fg is a morphism. So <clears throat> So we put Zij to be, um, what is it? The inverse image by F of uh, uh, the open subset, so <coughs> Ui. So x somehow lies in, P, so no, x lies in Pn y lies in the m, and we have the ui and the uj there. So the inverse image of ui intersected. Okay. As f and g are morphisms, this is an open subset of z, and this is an open subset of z, so this is open in z. And clearly, um, uh, Z is covered by these Zij's if I go over all I and J. And so, um, thus, um, Fg is a morphism 
if and only if its restriction to each of the ZIJs is a morphism. Because we know that uh, something is a morphism if its restriction to all open subsets of an open cover is a morphism. So if and only if FG restricted to ZIJ is a morphism for all IJ. Okay, now we just look what it is. So I take this map ZIJ and I apply to it the map F, G. So a point P is sent to F of P, G of P. Well, this will send us to X times Y intersected UI times UJ. Okay, we want to show that this map is a morphism. We compose with um, the phi i times phi j. This phi i and phi j we know are isomorphisms from u i times u j to a n times n. So this is phi i of x times phi j of y. So, so this map is an isomorphism. So in order to see that the original map FG was a morphism, it's enough to show that the whole composition is a morphism. Is a, is a morphism. But notice now we are in the affine case. So this is, we are just looking. So this map is just phi i composed with f, phi j composed with g, which is uh, the map z i j to a n plus m. And so this is the, you know, now we are looking at a morphism from z i j to a n and the morphism from z i j to a m. And this is, you know, the product morphism according to the universal property on, uh, for affine varieties. So this is a morphism. And actually, okay, this is not necessarily closed, so for, say, quasi-affine varieties, like I said in the beginning of the lecture. So we can reduce the statement to uh, the affine case by using this cover. So that means we have this universal property. So, again, this says just that it's very easy to say what the morphisms from anything to the product are. They are just given by pairs of morphisms to the factors. So I can uh, give a couple of trivial examples. Uh, I mean, to just what of what morphisms are. So for instance, if... Um, F from X to Y and uh, G from Z to W are morphisms, then I can take the product of these morphisms, F times G from X times C to Y times W is a morphism. 
And here, obviously, what I mean by this is that the map PQ is mapped to the pair f of p uh, g of q. And this is um, essentially trivial because what is f times g? So as a map from x times z to this thing, I'm saying that f times g is just equal to we take, we start here, we take f composed with p1, so we first project to x and then we apply f, no, it just means we take f of p, um, comma g composed with p2. And so therefore it is a morphism. And uh, I mean, this is not very exciting, so in particular, If uh, X is isomorphic to Y and um, uh, Z is isomorphic to W, then X times Z is isomorphic to um, y times w. That's kind of clear. So if f, so assume we have f from x to y is an isomorphism, g from z to w, an isomorphism, then f times g from x times z, no. Yeah to y times w is a morphism, but it is even an isomorphism because the inverse is obviously the product of the inverses. Okay, so this is all very simple. Now, my time is... Um, essentially up. So we will, uh, at the, in the next lecture, we will talk about uh, two important uh, properties. So <clears throat> that I already kind of hinted at uh, before. So one is uh, uh, separatedness. So if you have <clears throat> um, so it actually uh, the statement is uh, that if you have the diagonal in x times x, so if x is a variety and you look at its diagonal, so this is a closed subvariety, that is actually a non-trivial statement. So and this is um, um, uh, <clears throat> and this is the um, this is called separatedness and it has some uh, nice properties. You can somehow imagine that it is related to things behaving a little bit like uh, you know it's a little bit something like a Hausdorff property that the diagonal is closed. No? Um, it is. For instance, if uh, the topology on the product of X with itself was the product topology, then it would be equivalent to, to then Hausdorff would be equivalent to the diagonal being closed. But the Zariski topology on the product is not the product of topology for Zariski topology, so that's not quite true. But somehow, still, the fact that the diagonal is closed will give us some properties which are similar to, to Hausdorff if we study maps. For instance, we find that the graph of, of morphisms is closed, like you are used to, you know, uh, and similar things. <coughs> and the, 
second statement uh, will be completeness. And that is what should replace um, the compactness properties. So it is, so completeness is a bit more difficult to describe, but one consequence is that, you know, if you have a variety which is complete, then the image of any morphism starting from that variety will be closed, okay? And this is a, you know, this is in some sense you can view as a new way to make a, a you know, projective varieties. You just take the image of any morphism. And um, <clears throat> we, it is not true that all varieties are complete. In fact, what is true that is, a sen is that a variety is complete if and only if it is projective. So it's really a special property of being projective. And that's also compatible with what I have tried to say, that somehow projective varieties are what we want to replace compactness. So, okay, and we will prove that. And uh, the, uh, this actually is slightly tricky proof. And uh, then, uh, uh, with that, we should be more or less uh, uh, be done. And afterwards, we come to rational maps. Anyway, so this is the next time will already be on Friday. I, yeah, because I think I had to skip some lectures, so I have to catch up.